Welcome to the Theology in Motion podcast. Join us for conversations about the theology of worship, its practice, culture, and design. The Theology in Motion podcast is by the Center for Worship Leadership, Christ College, Concordia University, Irvine, in California. Hey there, everybody. Hope you're all doing well. Before we get into our episode today, I just want to take a quick moment to invite you to our upcoming summit. The Center for Worship Leadership has something called the Worship Arts Leader Initiative. We have a gathering in Chandler, Arizona, and South Phoenix coming up October 11th through 13th. Among our speakers will be Zach Hicks sharing from the worship pastor and also his new book, Worship by Faith Alone. That's going to be pretty exciting, pretty fun to be together. The conference itself is full of different opportunities to hear speakers, to go to breakout sessions, to explore some musical opportunities, there's even some songwriting coaching. It's been a great time. Check out our website, cwlonline.org, if you're interested in learning more. And if you're local, there are even options for one-day intensives I think you'll like. All right, enough of that. Check it out and hope you enjoy this conversation with Lester Ruth and Sui Hong Lim. Welcome to Theology in Motion. My name is Steve Zank, and on behalf of the Center for Worship Leadership at Concordia University in Irvine, I'm glad that you're here. Today, we're delighted to have two distinguished guests, Drs. Lester Ruth and Sui Hong Lim. Lester Ruth is a historian of Christian worship. He works as a research professor of Christian worship at Duke Divinity School. Before arriving at Duke at 2011, he taught at Robert E. Weber Institute for Worship Studies, Asbury Theological Seminary, and Yale Divinity School. Dr. Sui Hong Lim is the Deer Park Associate Professor of Sacred Music at Emmanuel College in Toronto and the Director of the Masters of Sacred Music program. Before joining Emmanuel in 2012, Sui Hong served as Assistant Professor of Church Music at Baylor University uh, and Lecturer of Worship, Liturgy, and Music at Trinity Theological College in Singapore. Now, together, these two have been researching the history of contemporary worship uh, or contemporary praise in worship. We'll get into the terms today, a rather important part of the conversation. Their latest book is A History of Contemporary Praise and Worship, Understanding the Ideas that Reshape the Protestant Church, and Baker calls it a landmark volume. Okay, well, Baker printed it, but I'll tell you, (laughs) I myself and many others absolutely agree about the importance of this work, and so it's a joy to be with you both today. Guys, thanks for making the time to have this conversation with me. Our pleasure. Uh, well, let's start. It seems to me that one of the, f- the fundamental insights in your book and the, and the history of this movement is actually you identify it as more than one movement. Uh, you have two major movements you identify. How did you come to the conclusion that there were these more than one streams that were leading into what we call modern worship in some places? And uh, what are those streams? You want me to start, Sui Hong? Please do. Um, It was a realization that we had as we were going through the material, the primary material, especially um, uh, writings of the people who were trying to start it and advocate Mm -hmm. it and spread it. Um, And what we began to notice is that even though they might be describing a way of worship that when done, looks awfully similar uh, when they were explaining why we ought to worship that way, the reasons were very, very different, including especially um, what scriptures and the scriptural support. Mm-hmm. Um, and and we were actually attending um, a worship technology conference together in Dallas, trying to figure out a way to organize this rather complex history so that the readers didn't get whiplash having to go from here to there, you know, in the course of several pages. And it dawned on us, why don't we just separate out essentially what these two stories are, uh, tell one of them, back up, tell the other one, and then finally tell how they kind of flowed into each other in the 1990s. And so... It really was working closely with the materials themselves and noticing the different motivations and explanations that the people were giving. Anything you want to add to that, Sui Hong? Yeah, let let me chime in to say that when my previous experience was a church music director in Singapore, 
And when I was a music director, the Methodist Church there had two different kinds of contemporary praise and worship service. There was a morning one that made use of the songs, and its primary purpose was, well, this will be an alternate uh, service form compared to the traditional uh, worship, uh, Methodist worship a- approach. There was no speaking in tongues, there was no uh, calling for healings and things like that. But then there was an evening service, and that would be the one that they use the same song. But they were doing things like, well, we will enter the presence of God with praise, we will do mm-hmm. speaking in tongues, we will do deliverance, we will do prayer ministry and things like that. So even though the two different services were using the same song, the approach, the theological undergirding <laughs> were different. So I didn't know how to phrase that until we met up you know, at the technology conference in Dallas. I said, ah, okay. And it, it struck a note with me. So I said, okay, that's the way to go. Yeah. I think it's such a, such a critical insight. The way you said that is so interesting. There's an there's a anthropologist named uh, Geertz. He talks about thin description and thick description, and I think this is kind of a key aspect of this research you've done, is a thin description of something like a, a photograph of what's happening without really understanding the meaning behind everything. So Geertz says, uh, if you witness a boy uh, blinking with his eye, like a wink, well, maybe that person is having an involuntary reaction, Maybe that person is winking at a friend because he's got some kind of thing happening. Or maybe the, there's a boy watching the second boy wink, and he's winking to make fun of that boy. You know, it, there's all kinds of meanings behind. And I think this is actually a critical place to say this is where these two different streams come into play when you realize you might see, like you said, Sui Hong, all these externals that appear similar, but really what's going on couldn't be more different potentially. So let's talk about those streams. Uh, Sui Hong, what would you say then, uh, when you got into it, what, how did you identify, what are the two streams? Lester, let's go to our favorite oh, song. Do to do do <laughs> yes. <laughs> Lester, yeah, go ahead. I, I think the, probably the labels for the streams are, are my creation. So I'll, I'll okay. take this. So um, we used an analogy of two rivers kind of flowing parallel to each other. And one of them we call the gift river and the other one we call the gap river as a way of identifying kind of um, the core thought in each one of them. So the gift river people see this new way of worship as a gift from God, something that's being restored back to the church with an emphasis on praise and through the praise, being able to experience the presence of God. So the motivation, the framework, the talking is very kind of God-oriented in a way. This is how the church experiences the presence of God in the world today, um, especially when it's gathered for worship. The other river we call the Gap River, and those folks really are concerned about what they see as an increasing gap between older ways of worship and where contemporary people are right now because of shifts in culture and society. Um, And so their concern is uh, the presence of the people, we might say, (laughs) the literal presence (laughs) of the people. They want to make sure that people come. And yeah. will stay. And so the worship adaptations occur in the Gap River, not in order to facilitate the presence of God, even though they would be concerned with that, but in order to make worship attractive and appealing uh, to people, uh, to new contemporary people. I mean, if someone would say, well, that, that sounds awfully artificial. Um, I mean, what we discovered is that there was actually a similar motivation behind all the surge in new Bible translations Mm. and paraphrases of the 1960s and 70s and 80s. Um, Increasing concern that in a modern world, the King James Version could no longer be a popular version Mm -hmm. that people could actually understand. And so you get a whole surge of new versions. Uh, what's happening in the Gap River in terms of worship is just a reframing of worship um, in order to try to make it relevant and accessible and understandable to people. 
So those are the two rivers, the Gift River uh, and the Gap River. Wonderful. And I, and thank you, the listener. Uh, these two gentlemen have agreed to be on this podcast uh, in two parts. And so today we get a focus just on that first river, the Gift River. And I really appreciate that. And our listeners are going to appreciate that, getting more into depth in these two rivers. And let's just start then, maybe in, in a backwards way, this is a history, but maybe let's start with today's practices. If we wanted to understand uh, where the Gift River has ended up for us today, how it, might we identify that movement in today's practices? How do you think that shaped um, uh, music, music sets, and the leading of music, Sweet Home? Because that will be a critical part. I think right now, most of the time, the gift people will actually be their their worship set or their music set will be musically driven. Mm. They are not so much constrained by the audio. I think if you are Lutheran in the Concordia, you know what I'm talking about. They're about fourfold pattern. That's the order they're going to be working from. Well, for the gift people, that's not their concern. Their concern would be, would this song set enable our congregation to encounter the divine? That would be their primary concern. So for them, uh, Bob Weber would say it's a two-part worship form. Praise and worship and the sermon. And that's how they would work that way. So they are not so much concerned about gathering, proclamation, response to the word, and then sending forth. That is not their primary concern. Um, and most of the time you find... if we took the opportunity to analyze music from Hillsong. Uh, we are looking at possibly four to six songs, and you can see that there's a praise section by the basis of the tempo, and then there's a section on worship, again, by the basis of the tempo. Um, and so you find that this particular form of music-driven is actually popularized uh, within the gift people that they mm. experience it. Now, tomorrow maybe I can talk a little bit about how music function within the 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 the, the other gap people, right? I mean, they are slightly different. They, I would I would surmise to say that they would be under constraint of the order, and you find sometimes mm -hmm. find them having a praise and worship segment, uh, plucked or juxtaposed within the order, so it doesn't have the kind of function in terms of. We want to encounter the divine through our song set. That's not that function. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a slightly different function uh, for the uh, the other group of people. I hope that helps. Yeah, so we hold, let me toss out something to see if you agree or disagree with it. Um, of the songwriters of contemporary worship songs, it seems to me that most of them actually come from the Gift River side of things. That that Gap people tend not to write the real popular songs. Yeah, well, the, the Gap people tend to write musicals in the past, in the 60s, 70s, Ralph Carmichael and all that. So their focus is much more on evangelism, much more on outreach. So when you look back in the past, in the 60s, 70s, where there were continental singers, there were musicals out there, those were the Gap people because they were using media to reach out and draw in young people into the church. So yeah. you find that there, they normally don't write what we call praise and worship songs. They, mm -hmm. they don't do that. They write musicals. And somehow this work, these musicals end up being a chorus in uh, praise and worship form. Sure. But if we're looking at Hillsong, Bethel, Elevation, Passion, all the British worship together folks, even the... Um, Stream of Praise, the Chinese, right. Right. those are all gift people, right? All gift, gift people. people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They, 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 gift people are the one who would say, I, oh, I, uh, God gave me a song last night, and let's try it this morning on a rehearsal. Uh, they are with that kind of mentality that they will do it. Um, you don't find that in the, the get people. Get people will really want to polish down and you know, really tighten the thing. They are typical composition major people. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Whereas the gift people will be a folk singer coming yeah. in their unwashed jeans and say, "I God gave me a song. Let's try this." That, that's yeah. the kind of approach. So if you understand where they're coming from, uh, then you begin to hear the songs. But there's no so, less of theological content, and you can tell that as well. You know. 
um, the give people songs tend to say, I want to encounter God. Yeah. I want to experience God in real way. Whereas yeah. the gap people tend to be, we sing about the praises of God. We yeah. sing about God's goodness. Uh, and not so much that I focus in that sense. Yeah. Right. So it sounds like you might even be able to say that if you encounter um, worship music on the radio, per se, that there's a good chance that a lot of what you hear there is is rooted in this this movement, potentially. You'll, at the very least, you'll if you listen for a few minutes, you will have heard something rooted in this movement, most likely. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I, oh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, on radio, you will hear people like Amy, w, Amy Grant, Michael W. Smith, uh, all these people. They do write. They do write nine songs. But most of the their writing, if you look at the lyrics, is very much an encounter with God. So when you guys go back then in the history and your research, uh, where did this come from? Where did it start in this modern American movement? Um, well, it didn't start in America. Over to you, Lester. <laughs> Good. I don't want to brag about Canada, no, but it didn't. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it, uh, it's Canadian. Yeah, Nor I mean biggest North biggest American. Good, good. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, because most people think when they think the start of this, they've got long-haired hippies in Southern California. Right. And, and they're in our story, but they're actually at the end of chapter three, I think it is. And uh, when we were designing the chapters, we intentionally delayed them to the end of chapter three, just so mentioning them would waylay everybody else's attention. So it's Canadian, it's Pentecostal. So the root sensibility that you praise in order to experience the manifest presence of God is a long-standing sort of Pentecostal sensibility. Uh, what it did is it took a particular shape in the late 1940s, especially um, under the teaching of one Canadian Pentecostal minister, Reg Lazelle, who developed this idea into a fairly robust, complete biblical theology. Um, and it got attached to a revival that broke out in North Battleford, Saskatchewan of all places. So, you know, most people, when they think of this history, they think Orange County, California, Los Angeles, you know, they don't think um, suburban Vancouver <laughs> right. and a small town in Saskatchewan. <laughs> um, but, you know, once the theology got attached to the revival, it very quickly disseminated across Canada and the United States, and the Pentecostals caught up in this revival were very missionary-oriented, and so they were quickly taking international trips, um, exporting both the theology and the emerging practices from the theology uh, to Europe, Africa, South America, um, and Asia. Um, yeah. Can we talk let about me jump in very oh, quickly please. to say it is, it, it is the theology as not the song. So you find that during the early movement period, the 1940s up to the 1960s, they were singing songs that we would be familiar with. There's a fountain filled with blood, amazing grace, and in four parts harmony. That was the, they were using the same song, but the theology undergirding the songs have changed. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I think our listeners need to be aware. Uh, this movement is not music. It is theology-driven. And that was how it became so fascinating for the two of us. Because no matter what they sing, we can detect the theology that they were using. And that gives us yeah. a sense of consistency as well. I hope that helps. Absolutely. I guess one of the critical parts of your book is as how you draw out these, these movements are rooted in theological convictions and ways of interpreting the scriptures. Can we, can we talk about uh, Reg Lazel a little bit? I found that the sure. story the story in the book about how uh, he came to this revelation is a really interesting one, if we could tell it. Um, sure. Um, so he's a retired businessman from Toronto, and he had done some informal speaking in the Ontario area, that's the province, and he got an invitation from the district superintendent for the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada and the British Columbia region, which is the very far western part 
uh, Pacific boundary. Um, lovely part of Canada, by the way. But um, hmm. um, all of Canada is lovely. I'll just say <laughs> that in case any Canadians are listening. Yeah. Um, so he goes out there and he gets to his first church, which is in a little town, um, uh, Abbotsford, if I remember correctly. Isn't that right, Sui Hong? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And the pastor's sick, and so he's got to lead the entire service, and it's going terribly. And so if you're Pentecostal, the last thing you want is just a completely flat service where God's not doing anything. So midweek, he goes in, and he, he's fasting, and he goes to the church early in the morning, and he's just praying, and he's praying, and he's praying, and this verse comes to mind. Psalm 22, 3, Thou art the Holy One who inhabitest the praises of Israel. And initially he thought, that's why we're not having a move of God. Uh, God is holy, I am not, and I have unconfessed, unrepented for sin in my life. So he spends the longest time confessing every possible sin that he could think of that he had done. And he's not fear, feeling any sort of stirring in his heart. And his mind goes back to the verse, and he says, well, maybe it's the second part. Hmm. Thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. God inhabits praise. So he said, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend the rest of the day filling this space with the praise of God. And he literally starts walking around the entire church building including the bathrooms, or um, I forgot what Canadians would call them. Um, washroom. Washrooms, yes. <laughs> going into the washrooms, that's the way his testimony is. Um, I, why? I mean, this is dedication to extend the praise of God even into the washrooms. Um, the funniest part of the story is when he's telling it, he says, and I lingered at the piano because the pianist was kind of cold. Um, I th <laughs> just a double dose of praise <laughs> yeah. at the piano. Um, and he continues on, and even as the people start to gather for that evening service, he goes up on the platform, kneels by his chair, continues the praise until the start of the service. Then he stands up, uh, turns around, announces the first hymn, um, and midway through the first hymn, a woman in the congregation uh, the Holy Spirit falls on her, and she begins to speak in tongues, and then another, and another, and another, and another, and that Lazelle says, this is it. Yeah. God, I'm, I'm going to put words in his mouth, God shows up when we dedicate ourselves to praising him. And uh, he spent the rest of the week with his Bible concordance. He didn't know Hebrew. He didn't know Greek. He was a businessman had no theological, official technical theological training, but he looks up every Bible passage on the word praise that he can find. Uh, Psalm 22, 3 holds the centerpiece of his theology. He soon links that up with Hebrews 13, 5, or 13, 15. Oh, goodness, I used to know these off the top of my head. Uh, to offer the sacrifice of praise with our lips, Essentially, he sees that as a command to praise whether or not we are feeling like it. Yeah, continually, I think, is the key in that yes, the idea. Yes, continually. Of, yeah. And so what he's reacting against is an aspect of Pentecostal piety that he knew and that he had heard about, that you only do something if you felt the immediate movement of God. And he said, well, that's poppycock because we have an explicit biblical command of God in the Hebrew text, and we have an explicit biblical promise from God in the Psalms text. And so whether or not God's people feel like it, they need to start their services with an extended period of praising. And then when the presence of God is felt and experienced, that's when you shift into worship. And so he's developing that theology and those practices in 1946, 1947, um, after he returns home after his circulating for that short tour through British Columbia, the, the uh, district superintendent invites him back out to pastor a church, actually just right across the Fraser River 
from Abbotsford, uh, which he does. And then he gets a, another pastorate in mm. Vancouver a uh, year or two after that. And, um, you know, one of, one of the interesting backstories that we learned is that the founder of CCLI, which everyone will recognize, um, guess who his pastor was and in whose church he grew up and in whose Bible <laughs> college he went. <laughs> and it was Reg Lazelle. And so Amazing. when we interviewed uh, Howard Roshinsky, the founder of CCLI, he's just, I think we surprised him that we didn't want to ask him about CCLI. We wanted to ask him about Reg Lazelle. And he was just <laughs> effusive and just talked over and over and over again about how influential that man and his theology was on his life. Amazing. Yeah. And so what we've done now, as we told the story, is we've really rooted this movement in a interpretation of biblical theology. And I think what's, what you've done is you've shown that this founder of the movement, in some ways, was trying to trust God in what he believed to be God's promises, right? If sure. God, take God at his word, and, and he uh, started this theologically, then I want to ask you, Sui Hong, as this... Okay. Theolo- can, I, can I stop you right yeah. there, Steve? Oh, please. I'm sorry yeah. I interrupted you. You don't mind. But, you no, know, if fine. you think about it, the people who originate this are all what academics would call free church. Yeah. And the critical thing for free church Protestants, and it's been this way for 500 years, is grappling with Scripture to figure out how to worship. And as soon as we latched on to this, it's like, yeah, this makes perfectly good sense to make developing biblical theology to shape worship the centerpiece of the story. Um, Yeah. And in fact, it's almost a little surprising that no one else had really picked up on that because it's there yeah. and it's natural to the story. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah, thank you. I was going to ask uh, Sui Hong, as you think about then this, this theological movement and this foundation, what kind of skill sets did the musicians of this movement need to develop to support it? Were there specific uh, things that they started to do? To fulfill this theology in the in the midst of the church. Okay, so for this question, I'm going to take off my formal academic professor yeah. or secret music hat okay. and put on my hat is a charismatic keyboardist. And Great. What I will say is sensitivity to the spirit, because mm. there is a move the 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 person who is going to be engaged in this uh, act of worship and providing the leadership for this particular work really needs to understand flow. And I think that's something that Lester and his team of doctoral students have written on. But it is this ability to sense the movement of the spirit. How long do you want to carry at the high point so that the engagement with the divine actually happens? Um, so it is not as simple as, well, I'm just going to play the Bach Chorale Prelude and then once it's done, it's done. No, it basically <laughs> right. means I'm going to play the Bach Chorale and I might be prompted to go back to the second system and do that again. Or I might do the third system at a slower pace and let the people yeah. feel the individual notes. So it's this ebb and flow, that, that sensitivity that needs to be experienced. And yeah. this is something that can be taught, let's put it that way, but it takes time. It takes effort. It requires a person... Uh, to have the sense of uh, sensitivity that is there, the, the feeling of the particular energy in the music. And that's the way to do it. Yeah, is that, is that because then, to understand it theologically, the musician is, is helping the people sing, and yeah, the, helping the people praise, more specifically, praise God? And in, that, in the praising, there's a certain place where the praising gets, is, is intense the right word, or uh, gets the right level? That the yeah. that God's manifest presence in that theology is interpreted to have to be to be there now is that right? And yeah. so you're trying it, to navigate towards that sp- space. Like for example, if if for for most musicians, if they were to be serving in the church and you give before them blessed assurance by Fanny yeah. Crosby, let's say yeah. I'm I'm picking hymns because that's the way I teach uh, traditional musicians to be able to to move in the flow. Most of the time, people would just, well, this is stanza one, we just do stanza one, chorus, stanza two, chorus, and just umpteen until four stanzas are done and the chorus is done. Right. My advice or my teaching would be, 
look at the context of where this song is within the audio, within the music. So I'm speaking to liturgical musicians now. If you know that this song is going to enter into a time of prayer, and the chorus goes with blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a fourth is. Why don't you capitalize that one? You know, hmm. so there's a way of where you can change the color of the music. You can change whether it be done by a soloist that just anchors and brings you into the time of prayer. Keep hmm. in mind the early movement were using hymns; they were not singing uh, <laughs> uh, songs from hill songs. They were not. Yeah. They were singing hymns, and they made use of the hymns to yeah. magnify and glorify God and and anticipate God's presence. So if they have done that in the 1940s, we can do that today as well. Mm. So music is not just an artifact that we go, well, 1 to 10 kind of thing, and, and just play without any feel. Every stanza needs to be different. Mm. Um, that's the way that we need to train our church musicians. Every organist needs to understand uh, registration of the organ. Well, the band cannot be playing every stanza. They need to take turns. They need to <laughs> yeah. weave in and out, right? Because if yeah. they play all the time, at the same time, it's called noise. It's not music making. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, Paul Baloch is right when he was teaching how, how do you work as a band. And, and I mm. think we as musicians need to understand this principle as well. Uh, uh, yeah. And that music has a particular purpose. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I think there's the need of sensitivity to the spirit, the place of the music in the, in the worship, and what it is function, and go yeah. from there. And I find interesting the story with with Reg. And in his case, he he was doing something very specific with the music, and it seems like the initial response to his movement, especially among Pentecostals, actually, was very negative. Right? They would come by his church and they would throw rocks and fruit through the open window, and they're very against this movement. Can we talk then about how how did this? I know you call it the latter rain movement, I think, in history, mm -hmm. right? How did the latter rain movement, how did it become more accepted by mainstream Pentecostalism? What was that that route like? Um, by disassociation. Hmm. So the latter rain people and the established Pentecostal denominations got crossways with each other fairly early on. And there are official denunciations of the latter rain movement by the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada and by the Assemblies of God and other people. So um, initially there was taint by association. So even the mm. theology wasn't all that acceptable. Yeah. And not the, notwithstanding the fact that they would make fun of the particular practices. So what happened in the 1950s, but increasingly in the 60s, is you started having some other Pentecostals pick up and adopt the theology who had more agreeable pedigrees, I might call mm -hmm. it that. Um, in the book, we highlight Judson Cornwall especially, and I've been doing some additional work on him. I think he's an especially important figure, a long time, lifelong Assemblies of God minister who was at a particular point in his ministry. In fact, he took his last church, which he didn't really want to take, uh, after God told him that if he took it, God would show him a safe way into the divine presence. Oh. Hmm. Um, and so he's in his church, and an old Bible college friend shows up one day, a missionary to South America, Argentina, who had himself gotten, had picked up on all this latter rain approach. And he teaches that to Judson Cornwall, um, who buys into it, he learns it, uh, he imbibes it, he teaches it to his own congregation, even though he felt like a complete novice, he says in his writings. Um, and Cornwall was strategically, or if you want to interpret it theologically, providentially placed at just the right moment in the late 60s and early 70s to be right on the precipice of a cross-denominational speaking and writing ministry. Mm. Um, 
And so you had in Judson Cornwall, and he's not the only one, he's probably the most prolific of these sort of people, you have someone who is able to mediate between the latter rain approach and theology with um, broader Pentecostalism, and Judson Cornwall is actually heavily involved in the charismatic renewal movement in mainline denominations. And so through Cornwall and others like him, you have a dissemination of the latter rain approach without the taint of latter rain association. Yeah. Um, and uh, to put it simply, well, if you want to interpret it theologically, the, all the gift people would say, of course it's going to spread because this is God's doing and this is right. God's restoration of a biblical way of worship. A more sociological explanation might just be simply um, people could do it. They could do it easily. They could do it well. And they had deep experiences of God when they did it. And so uh, the more it spread, uh, the more people who got associated with it and the more mm. people who got associated with it, the more it spread. It, it was a after you uh, tried it out, it sounds like, uh, people often experienced the uh, manifest presence of God. They, they, as that as that praise would want went on. They had seems like they're having a positive experience with it, which they interpreted to be the manifest presence of God. And then it, it uh, from there continued to spread. It's interesting to me is it seems like through Justin Cornwall and people like him who are more acceptable to Pentecostal and mainline and other people. Not it seemed like not much changed about the theology. There's additions maybe about and different uh, tabernacle theologies and typological interpretations of things, but it seems like the the kernel of theology wasn't changing through the passing and the dissemination. It was the same theology. Is that true? Would you say that's the case? Yeah, um, yeah. I guess my way of saying it is if what Reg Lazelle and the um, Latter Rain folks built in the '40s and '50s was a pretty compact um, ranch style house, you know, yeah. <laughs> but what happens in the late 60s, 70s, and 80s is that that core is still there. It just gets built upon and enlarged and increased. And, and what we started noticing, Sui Hong and I, as part of the organizing principle, is it seemed like everybody and their mother in this gift river eventually comes back to either citing, quoting, or alluding to Psalm 22, 3. Yep. God inhabits the praises of his people. In fact, I had one of my doctoral students recently sent me, it was Debbie Wong, sweet home, uh, sent me a YouTube clip of Leland, oh. uh, the well-known worship leader right now. And sure enough, he was singing a song that was based on Psalm 22.3. Um, it, it's just so much in the water. Um, and I, I personally knew I, we were really on to something when I was talking to one of my divinity school students here at Duke. He was in my intro to worship class, Lifelong Pentecostal, Church of God, Cleveland. And I asked him one day, I said, have you ever heard anyone say that God inhabits the praises of his people? And I can remember, I remember explicitly what Drew looked, said to me. He looked me right in the eyes and he said, every single Sunday of my entire life, mm. I have heard that verse cited at church. And that's when I knew, okay, we're, we're not just making up something. We've, we've hit a core aspect that's going to stay steady, notwithstanding the changes in how it's done, not with change, notwithstanding the changes in uh, the song repertoire, notwithstanding the addition of uh, megachurch versions of this, uh, notwithstanding the addition of all the technology. Ultimately, it comes down, praise God, experience God's presence, dedicate yourself to worship and adoring him then. That's what has stayed steady since the late 40s. And I had, a, I had a question about this, and maybe you'll have an answer because it's not in the book, and it's, maybe it's just not researched or 
you let me know. But I was really curious about the latter rain movement in connection to how we do this today. Uh, some people, as they experience this uh, gift theology of worship, the idea that if we praise God in the right manner, then his manifest presence will be amongst us. Uh, some people associate that with the Word of Faith movement, the prosperity gospel movement in America. Uh-huh. And I wonder if that was a modern trend, but then I was reading uh, some work by uh, uh, Kate Bowler on American uh, prosperity gospel, and she tra- uh, traces some of those movements back to uh, the latter rain movement. And so I was wondering, as we're tracing this movement forward in Psalm 22 as a theological centerpiece, are, are there uh, also tagalongs of prosperity gospel theology coming alongside, or is it a separate strand? Um, I'm going to handle this, if that's okay, Sweet Home. Is that okay? It, um, it, they're running parallel to each other. Hmm. And the prosperity gospel folks see something in Reg Lazell's theology that is in such good harmony with what it is that they emphasize that they can graft graft prosperity mm-hmm. thinking on this latter rain praise and worship thinking and it comes down to the instrumental nature of the praise so that's yeah. implicit in lazelle's original theology um is, is a, there's a causative instrumentality there if we praise god will be faithful to god's promise to come and dwell among us yeah. And it's that causative instrumentality, cause and effect. The prosperity gospel works on cause and effect. And um, and they like it. They pick up on it. They, are, they bring their own articulation to it. Um, it. It's almost... If I can shift the analogy to languages... The prosperity gospel approach is almost like a regional accent okay. to this latter rain theology. Yeah. Okay. Um, I could say, um, Sui Hong, come here, please. That's one way of saying it. Um, I can say, Sui Hong, get yourself over here. Or I can say, Sui Hong, get here. Come over here. Sui Hong, get here right now. Okay. I'm, I'm saying the same thing. Um, and for the listeners, I'm not making fun of people who speak like that. That's my background, okay? I'm from that part of Texas. I just imitated every one of my relatives, so I'm not making fun of them. Um, it, it, the prosperity folks, they like that instrumentality. Um, in fact, I was thinking about a quote from one of them today. Uh, Prayer asks something of God, praise takes it from God. Yeah. Um, and it's a different accent. Lazelle never quite go there, never quite go there, but um, quite goes there. there, there. I do speak English, folks. Um, but it, he bumps up right next to it, and what he, the, the boundary Lazelle bumps up right next to is a boundary that prosperity gospel shares, and they can take that notion yeah. and run with it. That yeah. was a long answer to a simple question, but I hope it made sense. It was. I thought it was very, very helpful. It sounds like there's a way in which uh, the American prosperity gospel movement is also a theological movement, having their own verses. They're not the same verses as this movement, but they, they would say, hey, this way of worshiping really works for us in our movement as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And and you start, um, who did we highlight in the book? A fellow named Charles Trombley from the 1970s. Very clearly a prosperity thinker. And you can see him picking up this latter rain theology and doing his own articulation on it. Yeah. Um, and publishing his material, his own approach to it in the 1970s. I have some more thoughts about it for our own listeners who, who tend to be conservative Lutherans or any... You know, we have some of those other people who are, aren't in that tradition as well. But for my sake, I'm really curious about one part of this story as you move into modern practice especially, is um, what do you do when you 
are taking these practices that are fairly, every, you know, they're everywhere, these practices, uh, popular songs are based on this theology. What do you do when you are trying to adopt the practices, but you, you can't adopt the theology? Does that make sense? So, you know, for example, there's all these great songs out there written in great instrumentation, great music, exciting, people like it, uh, but there's a sense of, you, there's churches and denominations that say, we don't agree with this interpretation of Psalm 22, 3, but we like your music. You know, how, how do we navigate some of that? I got an answer, Sui Hong, and do you want, do you want go to go? Ahead. <laughs> you go. I, I think for the more classic folks, I think the, the root concern is the same, which is the sacramental presence of God in worship. The more classic approach, however, is to attach that to the sacraments. So I think where the creative thinking really needs to be done is the appropriation of some of these practices in the particular location of the liturgy where our expectations for encountering God's presence is already high and strong hmm. and rightly so, especially yeah. at the Eucharist. I mean, think about it. Yeah. A Eucharistic prayer is essentially an extended time of praise and thanksgiving at the end of which we expect to encounter the presence of God. If you frame it that way, Lizelle's saying, yeah, that makes perfectly good sense to me. The difference is, is we've also got bread and wine involved in the process. Um, um, you know, so I had a simple thing. I, you know, um, why, why should we assume that everything done in the Eucharistic liturgy can only be said once, can't have cyclical repetitions to them, can be unconcerned with flow. Right. And it's just purely objective without any connection to the emotional state of the people. Um, I think that's where mainliners have something to learn mm. from this um, latter rain praise and worship theology. Um, I mean, on what Lester is saying, Nobody tells us, not the board of worship, that we can only sing one opening hymn. We need to get out of that <laughs> frame, right. right? You can see a medley of songs. You can see a medley of hymns, a medley of choruses yeah. for opening. I mean, and then if you really open the gateway, then say songs like this is the day I, uh, uh, he, uh, I come forward in joy and thanksgiving. These are all songs in the contemporary worship world that we can actually work in. And who says that we cannot blend the two together? Have we ever thought about doing uh, a contemporary praise and worship songs with crown him with many crowns? It is possible. Again, right. it takes a skilled musician to weave the two together. It is not impossible. I have done that when I taught at Baylor and I blew them away when I put organ with bass guitar, djembe, and acoustic guitar and they did an opening worship set. It is possible uh, to marry both worship songs and hymns. It, it just Wait, takes practice. I, I've played around with moving the location of the worship, praise and worship set. So at my previous school, we had, um, because there was, it was a little town, there was no church in town at all that had an Easter vigil. So we had an Easter vigil at the school and uh, we wanted to do it in a contemporary style. So we had to ask a question, where do you put the praise and worship set, the extended time of congregational singing, in a classic order of an Easter vigil. We put it after the proclamation of the gospel, after this continual buildup through scripture and yeah. light to this majestic proclamation that Christ is risen and he is risen indeed. That's when it felt like appropriate to spend 25 minutes in congregational song. Mm. Um, and the rubrics... The rubrics don't disallow that. They just don't quite countenance that. Um, but I, I can tell you it worked. And I think we need to get out of the North American 60-minute limit in our worship hmm. services. If you really want to do engaging in music making so that the people can encounter God's presence and you want to function within the order, it can be done, but it cannot be done in 60 minutes. 
So we need yeah. to break that myth. Um, and for me, I find that if, if the service is genuine and engaging, people will be willing to spend our 15 minutes, our 30 minutes in that particular experience. Yeah. And they will come back and ask for more because yeah. it engages them. Yeah. So yeah, that's it sounds the like challenge. Yeah, it sounds like we're saying that, th that this theology uh, may have driven uh, musicians and church leaders to develop new skills, like uh, f how to do certain kinds of flow, how to attend to, to we maybe call vibe, <laughs> uh, whatever those that means. Um, but uh, those those things could be used as as tools in many different traditions. You're just trying to maybe achieve different ends, but uh, the tools can be very similar. Yeah. And I, I appreciate that. We we had a fun experiment. I don't think I've told you about this, Sui Hong. At my, my class, about a month, month and a half ago, uh, we were talking about how do you preside at a Eucharistic service in a contemporary way. And I said, let's call into question that we can only do one thing at a time. So I got the class to start singing the really popular song um, by Sinatch, Waymaker. Oh, we make a, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, which is a highly repetitive song. Mm -hmm. It goes over. In fact, the song itself embodies praise and worship. It starts with praise and then it goes to worship in the structure of the song itself. So I said, y'all just sing this song. Uh, and we were using a YouTube clip that had all the lyrics up there. And I said, I'm going to pray a Eucharistic prayer over the top of it. And it worked marvelously. They, huh. The students just told me <laughs> what a... And that we were just practicing. We didn't even have the Eucharistic elements set out. We just wanted to see if it would work. But the overlay of a strong praise and worship congregational song like that with a classic Eucharistic prayer, it was hand in glove. It fit well. It felt totally contemporary. Um, I mean, the one thing I was doing, I was praying it extemporaneously. So there was there was a better flow than what you got from just reading a written text. I was attentive to the emotional ebbs and flows in the song itself as I was praying so I could time up what it was I was articulating in praise and thanksgiving and what the song was saying. Um, but it just, it, you know, um, if your listeners are thinking through their Eucharistic liturgies as presented on the page, from my end, the non-musical end, they must think of the Eucharistic liturgy as an organic thing that lives in their heart, not a static thing that's on a page. And if they can make that transition, then you can do some interesting mergers. Yeah, the, the things on a page, the things on a page work because they're designed. You know, at some point, they de we designed in our church body to put certain songs at certain places to achieve a certain result. And I th hear you saying is that you could use flow and design with other elements and achieve a similar result. Sure. In uh, both cases, you're attending to the design and flow of that experience. Yeah. I, in, the, favorite, in the congregation. Yeah. yeah. My favorite example is uh, how most mainline congregations, when they're doing the Eucharistic prayer, if they have a musical setting for the Sanctus, They'll sing it once and then quit. But if you look at the Sanctus, it's, you know, it's a Chris Tomlin praise song. I mean, it's kind of stream of consciousness, a fusing together of three or four. And if Chris Tomlin is listening to this podcast, I apologize. But, um, <laughs> you know, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Um, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. I mean, that's the, I mean, that it's, you know, it's not a hymn, it's a praise chorus. Yeah. You know, why do performance practices by us only presume that when we sing it, we sing it once, and then we move on to something else? Why couldn't that become the praise underlay as the prayers being prayed over the top of it? Yeah, um, interesting. I mean, well, the we're not I even would, adding a text there. I, I would I will counter this with a uh, uh, answer because we are limited by our sixty minutes, 
and the Eucharistic oh, service no. is much longer yeah. than 60 minutes. Yes. We need to get out of that 60 minutes. Then we can do some serious worship stuff. <laughs> so this there's a... something, I think what we're trying to say is there's something to learn from the Gift River people, the river of praise and worship, which yeah. is their term for this phenomenon. Yeah. I, I've really been enjoying this conversation and especially kind of go, going off in some of these ideas that are maybe off the book a little bit, but based on it. I, I want to ask, uh, as we start to close our conversation on the gift side of the history, it, could we say that a lot of this comes down, in terms of theology now, a lot of this comes down to, is it, could we say that the victory of uh, alternate an alternate view of sacraments than mainline traditions? Because Think about the in American history. You have uh, certain people coming in and saying, "Well, we believe that God is experienced uh, mainly through these the sacrament, the bread and the wine, the body and the blood." And there are other other traditions in America that say, "No, no, no. This is not the main place God is experienced. Uh, that God's experienced now through Reg, you're saying through our praises and through this worship experience." As we fast forward to our current age, it seems like uh, <laughs> one of those sides has won. In the in the cultural Christianity in America, is that fair to say? Sure. And uh, and that's kind of part of the story is that the theology that uh, God is is uh, experienced in the most uh, profound way through worship, as opposed to uh, traditional sacraments. This is the story of that victory for that group. Is that I mean, uh, am I off, or is that is that kind of what the story is? What do you think, Sweet Hall? Uh, I, I will want to quote uh, Lester and my professor, Jim White. Yeah. And he reminds us that the liturgical movement is like a pendulum. It swings back and forth. So you are right. The initial part of the church began with a focus on the, on the sacraments, right? But in the middle period of North America in the 17th to the 18th century, the focus wasn't on communion or the sacraments, but on preaching. So preaching became very important. Rhetoric became super important. And you had those, all those uh, conferences that had the weeping bench that really wanted people to mm -hmm. repent from God just from the preached word. And then in the early 20th century, we now have this particular move of music making. I would assert that in time to come, give or take another 10 to 50 years, this sense of the pendulum will swing back to a mm. kind of a ritual, mysticity, uh, mystic, mysticism approach uh, to worship making as well. Interesting. Uh, we can see that already. I think right in California, if you go to San Gregory Misa in San Francisco, you begin to see some of that bubbling up as well. Um, so I suspect there will be a kind of a move towards more ritualistic mysticism kind of approach. But then, coupled with contemporary praise and worship music. You will see that, because the pendulum will never be static. Um, that's the wise word from Jim White. <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't think the answer is that who has won. I don't think anybody has won. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, they might have won on a temporary base, basis, but no victory is static if the pendulum's constantly swinging, because... Um, and I, there are times when I'm wondering if we're already kind of pushing the outer boundaries here. Um, I think one of the big developments in the last 20 years is the reliance upon the gift people for ever increasing levels of technological sophistication to carry that sacramental sentence. So mm -hmm. not the praise itself, not the praise that is sung, but the praise that is sung in a setting with highly complex stage lighting, um, iMag TV, uh, fog machines, that sort of thing. And I'm, I'm wondering if we're eventually going to reach kind of an outer boundary where you can't crank up the soundboard to any higher level. You can't put in any new sort of light system but people are no longer getting the same praise and worship buzz, if I can call it that, and they'll have to start rethinking, well, maybe we can find Jesus in the preaching, and maybe we can find Jesus 
and the communion. Um, mm. And here's some data for us if you're interested. Hillsong has started looking at ancient song texts. So if you Google Hillsong and Anastasia, they have that. Michael W. Mm. Smith is writing Up News Day. So there are a lot of moves of recovering of Latin texts. Uh, Chris Tomlin is no different. He's looking at Isaac Watts. So there is already a kind of a, what I would call an Oxford movement, looking backwards to what is available in the past and then incorporating that into the, the, the songwriting uh, process. Of course, there are copyright issues that I will, and ethical issues that I would like to talk about, but this is not the place. But there is this of effort of trying to swing the pendulum back. So it's possible. Mm. Well, our last few minutes here then, let me ask you a closing question. Did we forget something that was so crucial and key? We have to just take the last couple of minutes to talk about it in this movement, or have we covered it sufficiently for you guys? Um, I think I would like to clarify the rather Good. complicated name on Good. our book title and and Let's the competing it. terms. Um, yeah. It's popped up, but I don't think either Sri Hong or I have actually tried to explain it. Um, one of the things that we noticed as we were once we had a gift river and a gap river and, and we knew which literature to put in which river, we noticed different people had different technical terms for this. <laughs> so generally the folks in the gift river, so that would be all Pentecostals. And uh, what we found out is virtually all non-white expressions of this phenomenon use the term praise and worship. Um, that's what they call it. And it, you can see the theology built into the label itself. Uh, when we talk in the next podcast, the Gift River people, uh, the Gap River people, I mean, they're the ones who use the term contemporary worship. And that's a term that tends to be very North American, tends to be very associated with mainline denominations, and very associated with white Christians, uh, not Christians of color. Um, and so the rivers themselves are, all, are partly identifiable by which is the preferred term. Um, and so for our book, we had, rather than choose one term or the other and risk excluding the breadth, some aspect of the breadth of the story, we just fused them all together because we couldn't yeah. come up with a better alternative. <laughs> yeah. But we could have come up with a completely new term, which nobody would have recognized. <laughs> That's right. Good. So we just said contemporary praise and worship. And what yeah. we find is that um, uh, you know, it's, it's broad enough and familiar enough that we've never really had anyone tell us we have no idea what it is you're talking about. So they can they tend to find themselves in the new term that we use, yeah. Which is just the two main terms fused together. Yeah, I can't say enough about this way that this book helps structure things in really helpful ways. Even just bringing that that uh, title that you mentioned, praise and worship, as a technical term, and I didn't realize that until recently. It's a as a technical term. I always thought it was a description of something, but the way you've used it in the book is a very technical way. And I'm going to say a quote from the book here from Charlotte Baker, who you quote. This is what she says about praise and worship. She says, Praise, an operation of faith, is an instrument which will create the atmosphere for the presence of God, where he is to dwell. That's praise. In contrast, worship is the expression of a response to his presence. And I found that, that once I realized that that was the theology from where this was coming, and then it made sense that this is called praise and worship because there's a technical definition of praise, a technical definition of worship, and together they also form a technical definition of a theology of worship. And anyway, I, I just want to commend you both for the way that you've dealt with the, the titles and the, the explaining those to us as readers. Thank you. And, and one of the fun things for me is to discovering what an international term praise and worship is and various languages. Um, it's, uh, 
It's around the world. I, I usually at this point ask Sui Hong to say it in Mandarin, but I won't. Um, <laughs> Sui Hong, Lester, thank you both for joining us for this episode of Theology in Motion. It's been a great pleasure to have you. And thank you for joining us for this episode of Theology in Motion. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did with Drs. Lester Ruth and Sui Hong Lim. Please join us next month for part two of our conversation with them and their new book. On behalf of the Center for Worship Leadership, I'd like to invite you to our upcoming Worship Arts Leader Initiative, the Wally Summit in Chandler, Arizona, in South Phoenix. Among our speakers will be Zach Hicks talking about the worship pastor, but also, I think, a sneak peek into some of the material coming out in his new book, Worship by Faith Alone. That is October 11th through 13th. There are also optional intensives for locals. Check out the registration page at cwlonline.org. We really hope to see you. Thanks again for listening and for joining us. We'll see you next month.